So, good morning, everybody. Um, so, in module two, we're going to be going over genome visualization or data visualization. Um, the overall structure of this module is to try and gain an understanding behind why we actually visualize our data despite having many tools to process them. Um, you're going to be able to learn how and when to use particular, particular tools. You're going to gain experience with genome browsers, most specifically the Integrated Genomics Viewer, IGV. Um, and then finally, a bulk of the lecture is going to be on how we do variant inspections, whether it's single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNVs or structural variants itself, and a little bit on how you can configure your window to view long read data since it's quite different from traditional Illumina sequencing. The general org organization of this module is going to be part one, where we just generally go over visualization tools, the different kinds of genome browsers, their advantages, disadvantages, um, and then IGV itself. And then for part two, we'll actually go with variant inspections of single nucleotides and structural variants, and then how do you adjust your window for packed biosequencing specifically, although it's similar to Oxford Nanopore. So for part one, visualization tools, the first question we have to ask is, why do we even view visualize our data? Um, throughout any work you do, you're going to be running multiple programs on your data. You're going to be doing multiple tests. You're going to gain different statistics. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself a question of whether the statistics actually explain the data itself. To help answer this question or address this question, a mathematician named Anscombe developed four data sets. You can see them over here with X and Y. All of these data sets have about the same kind of statistical information, their average values, the variance, the correlation between X and Y, and they have the exact same linear regression. Now, if you were just doing purely statistics, you would assume that all these data sets are about the same. However, if we just simply plot these two data sets, we see that they're actually quite different. The top left data set does fit our linear regression, so the statistics do work for it. But our top right, we can see that a linear regression isn't probably the best approach to try and deal with this kind of data. We need a more general regression, such as a quadratic model. Our bottom left data set does fit an almost perfect linear distribution, except for that one outlier. So you'd need a more robust regression. And our bottom right is a good example of how a single outlier can lead to a linear correlation, even though you shouldn't have one to begin with. All of this information isn't viewable if you're just looking at the statistics itself. So it's always a good thing to just look at the data and try and figure out what you're dealing with. Uh, a Toronto group also developed this data source dozen. Um, what you can see is that they set a series of points and in the shape of a dinosaur and calculated the x mean, the y mean, the standard deviations, and the correlations. And then what they did was using or conserving those statistics, they actually made a dozen other uh, distributions of these points, all of which have the exact same statistic. Now, there's no way you can actually say that all of these data sets are exactly the same, which gives you an understanding of why we do visualize our data to try and determine any outliers or anything that we would immediately be able to notice. So in terms of visual processing, there's actually two main categories of your visual processing systems. There's the pre-attentive and the attentive. The pre-attentive is anything that strikes out at you when you immediately look at it. So on the left side, it's probably the easiest version of where's Waldo, because you can find Waldo right there without actually having to look at it. And this is actually your pre-attentive um, visual processing because it's, your, it's the portion of your brain that immediately finds an outlier. If you're using your attentive visual processing, it's when you're trying to comb through massive amounts of data and find what's probably different in that data set. And the reason this is important to notice is we want to be able to arrange our data in such a way that we're taking or we're leveraging our pre-attentive abilities as well. So in terms of outliers for this third row over here, having a different color immediately strikes out at us rather than small differences in shape. So it's something to keep in mind whenever you're trying to pick the best strategy of visualizing your data itself. What this also tells you is that your human visual system is probably one of the most efficient and low cost types of approaches to dealing with data and trying to find any outliers that might be present. Um, it 
also is very, very simple compared to writing lines and lines and lines and lines of code where you don't know what to expect in terms of what you're looking for as well. So regardless of the kind of data you're going to be working with, whether it's SNB, structural variants, new genes, proteins, it's always a good idea just to look at the data itself. To address this question, there are actually over 40 different genome browsers that have been developed. Each of these genome browsers tries and takes a different approach or a different strength um, that it'll focus on to give itself an edge over its competitor. The kind of genome browser you use depends on the task at hand, what kind of data you have, how much data you have, um, what the attributes of the data is, whether the data is locally stored or it's securely on a server, um, because it changes how you're going to gain access to it and how you're going to actually use the tool itself. A few of these um, genome browsers are IGB, which we'll talk about more in depth in a second. The UCSC Genome Browser, which I'm guessing most of you have used already, it's an online genome browser where you can just upload small sections of your data and end up viewing them. Um, Galaxy, which is an online platform for bioinformatics analysis, actually also has its own uh, built-in genome browser where it does small sections of visual analytics as well. Um, and then the Savant Genome Browser, which is used just shy of IGV, um, has an advantage where you can actually annotate any structural variants you find, something that's not possible with IGB. So that's what Savant's taken an approach of um, to try and give itself an edge. But for the purpose of this module and this course, we're going to be talking about the Integrated Genomics Viewer. Any slides you see that have this little Broad symbol on the top are taken from the Broad website who've developed IGV, um, and we're just using their slides for educational purposes. So what is IGV? IGV, in the simplest way, is a desktop application for interactive visual exploration of integrated genomics data sets. IGV's advantage is that it's able to handle multiple different types of data that you provide it all at the same time, whether it's epigenomics, microarrays, um, alignments, RNA sequencing, and copy number variations, and a multitude of other types of file formats. And it's already been pre-configured to view this data in a very optimal manner without you having to adjust any of these parameters. What you're able to do is you're able to explore large genomic data sets intuitively, taking advantage of that pre-attentive visual cortex. Um, you're able to integrate multiple data types with clinical informations and try and sort them out to try and see any patterns that, um, say, a mutation might be present more in males than females. Um, you're able to load data in multiple ways, whether it's locally, remotely, or cloud-based, which is a huge advantage since um, most data storages are moving from remote locations to cloud-based locations. And you're actually also able to automate any tasks that you would do on IGV from a command line interface, which means you can run whatever you want on IGV, leave your computer on overnight, and it'll do all the tasks that you would manually have to do. Like I just mentioned, IGV does allow you to pull data sources from multiple different files, whether it's locally, from the TCGA, genome space, um, or servers themselves. This gives you the advantage of collaborating with people across the world. As long as they have access to your SharePoint, they can actually view any of the alignments or any of the data files that you currently have. For IGV, just in general setup, um, the basics are being able to launch IGV, selecting the right reference genome, which will actually throw off any visualization you do, um, loading the data and then navigating through them. So in the case of whole genome data, it's viewing single nucleotide variants and structural variations. Now, all of you should have seen this page when you went to download the right version of IGV for this tutorial, um, but there are different kinds, or there are two main different versions of IGV. One is the Java platform or Java web-based application that you can download, um, and the other one is a binary file for Windows and a Mac app that you can install on your computer as well. They both have advantages and disadvantages. The Java application has the advantage that it's just a single double click to be able to run. Um, the different versions of IGV account for different memory requirements that you have, which is based on your computer itself. But once you launch IGV, you'll end up seeing this initial window. First and foremost, always remember to select the right genome. Because if you're doing, say, stuff on GRCH38, the newest build of the human genome, but you have the wrong reference genome lined up, the second you load any data, all of your reads will be colored as a rainbow. And the reason for this is because the positions don't exactly line up and you get SNVs called all over the place. 
It's really nice to see from like a visually appealing perspective, but it tells you absolutely nothing about any analysis you do. Once you have the right genome specified, you then load your data. The way you can load it is it gives you different um, options, whether you're loading it from a file locally on your computer, from a URL that you have access to, or from the server. Loading from a server also allows you to load different annotations that are present that the Broad has already indexed. Um, <coughs> Whether you're doing uh, ensemble genes, UCSC genes, GC percentage, um, if you want the database of genomic variants, it's all readily available. The version that you use is a bit restricted, so you need to keep that in mind whenever um, we load stuff from a server, but we'll get more into that in the actual lab component. If you load up the tutorial basics, they end up loading up the following tracks over there. This is how your view looks but that's the breakdown of the actual IGV um, space. So you can see the menu above where you have files, the genomes, any options that you want to play around in IGV or play around with the data. Your toolbar up there is where you actually loaded up your genome. A search bar allows you to be able to jump to specific coordinates or genes by just searching right inside. Your genome ruler above tells you where along the genome you're currently viewing your data. The track names for the files you've loaded up are displayed on the left side, as well as an attributes panel. You can customize this attributes panel to include any phenotypic information that you guys actually want. So the more information you have or the more information you want to be able to parse with, the more information or columns that will be viewed there. The actual tracks themselves are displayed in the center over here um, in this data panel. And then any additional tracks that you've loaded up, say RefSeq genes or GC percentage, is shown along the bottom over here, or if it's loaded on top, they're usually separate tracks themselves. When you say tracks, you mean sequence? Um, so they don't have to be sequences. They can be annotations, they can be um, genomic variants, but they're displayed as one singular row instead. What do you mean loading annotation? So if we jump back over here, see how you have different annotations over here? So you have annotations, you can load stuff from the breast cancer cell line. So what you can have is GC locations, you can have common SNPs, you can have cosmic uh, SNPs, and all of them will be displayed on the bottom and as a separate row. So RefSeq genes will be its own, DGV will be its own, uh, cosmic SNPs will be its own, so on and so forth. So, like I mentioned, IGV's advantage is it's pre-configured to handle different data types. You can, you can simply load up different files with any of these extensions into IGV, and it preemptively knows how to process your data and view it in the best possible form. Um, each of these data types does have to follow its um, IGV's expected input, so that you have to put it in the right format, but once it's in the right format, IGV will take care of everything else. Um, all of this in information is available at the Broad website, so I'd suggest looking into the file format before loading anything, So, if, because if your extension is different from the file itself, IGV will end up throwing an error and then you're stuck in a loop. And you'll just be sitting there trying to figure out why nothing works. Once you have your data loaded up, for example, BAM files, what you'll initially see is that coverage track above, which tells you your overall read depth at different positions. But then you won't be able to actually view any reads themselves. And the reason for this is when you're loading BAM files, you're loading gigabytes worth of information which will either slow down or if not crash your computer. To be able to actually view it, IGV itself tells you to zoom in. Now, depending on how far you need to zoom in before you can see any of your alignments, it's based on your computer's memory requirements. Generally, IGV is pre-configured to about 30 kilobases. So in the 30 kilobase window, you'll start seeing all of your reads mapped to each location. But if you want to set a different threshold, you can just change this in preferences. Now, you would change this based on different metrics, how good your computer is at, based on how much memory it has, as well as the kind of files you have. If you have very, very deep coverage files, that means you have massive amounts of data in a very small section of the genome window, so you'd want to reduce this, um, this preemptive loading based on a length of being zoomed in. Um, the more data it loads up, the slower your computer moves, which means the longer it takes you to do any task. If you run out of memory, IGV will throw an error. It'll just stop loading everything completely. You need to clear up memory before you can continue going. But once you have data loaded up, 
this is what you end up seeing. So each of your reads is going to be displayed, mapped to the reference. You can see the sequence below in this colorful um, bar on the bottom. Each color corresponds to the reference base, A, T, C, and G. And then what we can also see is that our reads themselves also have little notches of color on them as well. And these notches of color correspond to S and Vs between our read and the reference present. The colors are also um, based on the S and V itself. So A, T, C, and G have each different colors respectively. So you get different mismatches. Now, I don't know if it's that easy to see, but the base quality information, so how certain it is about that base, is also displayed based on how deep of a shade of color you view. The lower your base quality for your SNV, the lighter the shade is because you have less confidence. So what IGV is basically doing is it's preemptively filtering out low quality SNVs and trying to view more high quality SNVs that you can pick up from your visual cortex itself. Just like I just mentioned. So now we're more in part two of the lecture where we're trying to see what kind of metrics we're looking for when we're dealing with SNVs and structural variants. So for SNVs, the metrics that you need to keep in mind is the coverage. So how many reads you have that cover that specific position, the amount of support for that SNV. So how many of them are an SNV versus how many of them are the wall type um, base. Your strand bias and PCR artifacts. If you see that all of your SNVs are on the forward strand or reverse strand, you usually have less confidence in it because that might be a sequencing error. Or if it's the exact same read going all the way down that has that SNV, that would be a PCR artifact. Um, your mapping quality. So if we go back a slide, you can see that the reads over here are colored gray. Now, the lower your mapping quality is of that read, the lighter the shade becomes until it becomes pure white. So pure white reads have no confidence in where they're mapped. They're usually multi-mapped to different locations. So the information they provide is less confident to or less trustworthy. Um, and then the base quality is similarly the deeper the shade, the more confidence you have in that base being called correctly. For structural variants, we're going to go over these metrics a bit further on, but coverage is again important for structural variants. But in this case, we're going to leverage insert size, which Jared talked about, um, and the read period orientation, whether your reads are going in the order we expect or they've been shifted. So if we take an example of an SNV or a SNP that we would trust, uh, what we can see over here is that at this specific position, we have an SNV where a C becomes a T. Looking across this, we can see that the first T that's viewed in this window is a bit lighter shade compared to the rest, which means it's a low base quality one. Uh, but we see that the SNV is actually present at about 50% of the coverage at that location. And beyond that, it's also present on both forward strands and reverse strands which means we have high confidence or higher confidence in this SNV being true. Like I was talking about with annotation tracks that you can load up, in this case on the bottom you can see that an SNV a SNP calls annotation track has been loaded up below here and we see a DB SNP position at this location. So it's a common SNP that people have already currently annotated. So that gives us even more confidence that this must currently exist. Um, an SNV that we would have less confidence in is one over here. The reads are colored based on their orientation. So if they're forward reads, they're red. If they're reverse reads, they're blue. And we see that our SNV, where our A became a C, is only present on these reverse strands over here. So because they're only strand specific, we have less confidence in them. Um, but it is an SNV that's present in the DB SNP calls. So it may or may not be true. Yes. Uh, in the previous slide, you said that the SNP was present on about 50% of your reads. Yes. So how would you differentiate between a SNP and allelic variation? Um, so what you can do is you can look at other SNPs that might be present along the read itself, try and see whether they're mutually inclusive or exclusive. Um, otherwise, you would have to try and sequence it using allele-specific sequencing. So you separate your two alleles and you, do, um, you sequence each one individually to be able to determine that. But that's a bit difficult to try and figure out from just a visual inspection. Okay. So those are just quick metrics on figuring out um, SNVs or SNPs that might be present. For structural variants, we use or IGV leverages paired-end information. 
um, mainly because it's the most common type of sequencing we do, and it does provide an extra layer of information that we can actually um, sort through. The alignment coloring that we end up doing to view these structural variants are based on the inferred insert size <coughs> as well as the pair orientation. Now, what I mean by that is as follows. Whenever we're sequencing a long stretch of DNA, like Jared, said, like Jared mentioned, you can't just sequence the entire thing from start to end in one contiguous manner. So what we do is we shear the DNA and we try and target specific <coughs> fragment lengths. So we get it's, all of our shear DNA is about a Gaussian distribution that's centered along a specific fragment length. We then take these fragments and we sequence them from either end while having a gap of DNA in the middle that we don't know the sequence of. And that becomes our insert size. So this insert size is basically the distance between the forward read and the reverse read that we know came from the same fragment itself. When we align this back to the reference, the average value of this insert size is our inferred or the average distance between these two reads becomes our inferred insert size. So it could be 300 base pairs, 500 base pairs, depending on how you did your library. What ends up happening though is because this insert size should be about the same across your genome, when you have structural variants like deletions, insertions, or interchromosomal rearrangements, this distance between the two reads actually gets shifted. It either gets larger or smaller or becomes enormously different, and that helps gives us evidence of one of these structural variants happening. So we're going to take the case of deletions to try and explain or try and explain how this actually works. So when we have a deletion in our subject over here, our sequence of or our section of red DNA is actually removed from their genome. So what we end up having is this smaller set of DNA. We share this DNA and we sequence it using paired and sequencing. So we get the same kind of insert size we would expect across all of our library. But when we map this back to the reference genome, each of these pairs actually map across the deletion that had happened. So the insert size that we expected is actually very different from the insert size that we have found when we've mapped back to the reference. Because the inferred insert size is larger than the expected value by a considerable margin, we know that there should have been some kind of structural variant that happened there, in this case, a deletion. What IGV lets you do is you can literally, literally color your alignments by the insert size, and it'll visually spot out any reads that have insert sizes that are larger than expected, shown over here by those red reads over that red reads present. What you can also see on the coverage track above is your coverage actually dips across the section and then returns back to normal once you've crossed this deletion. So it's two different ways of visually finding a deletion um, just by looking at the data that you've loaded up. Insertions, on the other hand, will give you a smaller insert size than you expected, and IGV will color those as blue. And if you have interchromosomal rearrangements, one of your pairs will map to one chromosome, but then the other pair will map to a completely different section. Now, since IGV only lets you view a small window of the genome at any point, the way it tells you information about these, re these interchromosomal rearrangements happening is it'll color its ma the mate of the um, read pair according to which chromosome it maps to. So for example, in this tumor normal um, window over here, you can see chromosome one and chromosome six line, um, being viewed at the same time. And you can see that on chromosome one, some of your reads are colored orange. These reads are colored orange because they're indicating that the mate of each of these reads is actually mapping to chromosome 6. And we, we jump to that location in chromosome 6, we can see that its mate is blue, which, going back to this previous slide, tells us it's mapped back to chromosome 1. This color scheme is already pre-configured in IGV, and you can always view it back on the website. Yes? The question regarding your previous point about the deletions and insertions. So, so the um, insertion itself is not just one size, right? It follows a normal distribution. The insertion itself is. If I select products, if I share my DNA and I select this product, let's say with the B cleaner or something, okay. they're not just one size, they're the size distribution across plus minus 50 base pairs. Yes. Right? So, how does the software distinguish like the size variation based on the normal variation of my insert versus the true deletion or insert? So the reason why is it can look across all of your reads themselves to try and gain a standard deviation of what all of your um, 
expected insert sizes should be. And then if you have insert sizes that are, say, two, three standard deviations outside of the norm, it'll end up flagging those. So they're parameters that you can adjust on IGV themselves on how strict you want that coloring scheme to be. Um, but generally, it can build statistics because you have so much coverage of your library. Right, there's kind of a threshold, right? I don't know yes. If, if you only have like a couple base pairs or three base pairs, or like say 10, 20 base pairs, it's a bit more difficult to determine that, especially if you have a large variability in your insert size itself. Um, so yeah, that is a caveat that you need, or that is something to take into account uh, when determining which insertions or deletions or what kind you're looking at. Do you have a lot of your paired ends are overlapping each other? I guess yes. That doesn't help much either. Right? No. So if you do paired end sequencing where your reads end up covering uh, the fragment in more than one run, it's basically like having one very long read. So you don't really have an insert size in that case because there's no distance between your two reads. Um, you do get more certainty in the bases that are being called at those locations. So you get more coverage in SNVs, but structural variants become a bit trickier. Um, but because most of them will be overlapping, if you do get insertions or deletions where it shifts completely, you'll be able to determine that. But then coverage becomes more your um, workhorse than anything else. So the other thing, aside from just the inf the, your insert size, is the read pair orientation. Because you're re doing paired and sequencing from either end, you expect your two reads to be going towards each other. So if you have inversions, duplications, translocations, or complex rearrangements where multiple things have happened, this paired orientation doesn't necessarily have to be conserved. Um, the orientation, when we talk about it for read strand, is from left side to right side. That's how we read it. And then the read order is your first read versus your second read in terms of word maps. So to help explain what this actually all means, we're going to use inversions as our example. So if we have this specific reference genome, and we have this section of the genome from A to B that's been inverted in our subject. What we end up doing is we'll shear the DNA in the subject and we end up using paired end sequencing to read um, the subject's DNA. When we map this back to the reference, the first read maps normally back to the reference, but our second read now is going to map going towards B. Similarly, if we sequence the end in our subject close to A, one of the reads maps perfectly back to the reference genome, while the other one maps all the way back to A. When we view these or link these reads up as pairs, we can see that the orientation of our reads are different from what we expect. They're not going towards each other, they're actually following in the same direction. IGV will color these, um, the left pair as light blue, the right pair as red, because it the left and the right are the ones that are inverted in terms of their locations. And what this helps give you evidence for are duplications that have happened or inversions or any of translocations, those structural variants. It's simply available at color and you color it by pair orientation. And you can see in this example over here that at those breakpoints over here where your coverage is dipped, you can see both forms of that left, left, right, right pair orientation, which indicate in this case that an inversion has happened. The breakpoints are what? The breakpoints are what's where the actual section of DNA has actually been inverted. Okay. So because that's so because of the way you end up mapping, it's difficult to map across those breakpoints, so your coverage ends up falling. But then the coloring of the reads themselves help give you the evidence of why the coverage has fallen, because there are different reasons why those actually occur. On the actual IGV website, you can actually see the coloring scheme that they have, um, accounting for the different kinds of read pair orientations you might see. When you see this RL, the green one on the bottom over here, that's usually the case when you have a du uh, tandem duplication happening. So the reads actually get flipped in terms of what order they're actually going to be mapped to. That covers structural variants. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over what happens when you try and view long read data. So this is actual data that um, like we use in our lab um, that's been masked anyways. So IGV will color indels of one or two base pairs as purple. <clears throat> Looking at this data, you can't see anything. You can't see SNVs, you can't see the bases that are called because PacBio itself introduces um, SNVs at a rate of about 15%. So it's very difficult to try and view 
these third generation sequences without doing some extra cleanup. Because the nature of your data in third generation sequencing is that you have very, very single nucleotide variants of indels or deletions, you can actually go to IGV and you can tell it to hide indels that are smaller than a certain number of bases because they're outside the scope of what you're focusing on. Simply eliminating small indels helps you be able to view your data in a much cleaner, much quicker manner. Now beyond that, you still have, yes? <coughs> so third generation sequencing is the term used for long read sequencers. So PacBio, Oxford Nanopore. Um, so they're given the term of third generation sequencing now. Whereas second generation is the paired end Illuminous. Um, once you actually have all those small indels hidden though, because your reads do still have some error rates at a certain position, what you can also do is tell IGV to take a consensus at any of these locations, otherwise you're dealing with multiple SNVs at a particular site. Yes? Uh, this indel threshold value you want, uh, would you obtain that from the manufacturer? Or? So you can obtain that from the manufacturer um, because it depends on so it depends on how frequently that's introduced in the data itself, and there are, it is different between what kind of technology you use. Um, people have also done studies and they publish how often these happen. Um, and then beyond that, the depth of your sequencing and the kind of reads you get does influence whether you'll still have those indels present. So if you get, in the case of say PacBio, um, if you get their subreads that you extract, you will have this kind of error rate. But if you sequence deeply enough, you get these consensus sequences that have already cleaned up all that information. So in that case, you won't actually view it. Um, so it is very much based on what kind of data you have. Um, but regardless, if you're using these kinds of platforms, if you don't have enough coverage, you do have random errors that spot at a location. And it's different between read 1, read 2, read 3, read 4. So what you kind of want to do is you want to call a consensus at that base. So all your data supports a specific call. All you do is go to preferences, alignments, and call quick consensus, and your data is finally clean enough that you can visually inspect any structural variants that might be present. Now, if say you have very complex data and you just want to look at the structural variants present inside of your um, sequencing, what you can actually use are some online structural variant viewers. Now, a couple of these are called split threader and ribbon. The advantage of this is all you're doing is you're uploading your results file to visually inspect what kind of structural variants are happening or if you have any patterns that might immediately strike out at you. Um, one of these that was shown at the Hospital for Sick Children was a chromoplexy event where you have, trans where you have two translocations connecting two genes that have no direct relationship to one another to cause a fusion gene that actually um, drives a specific cancer attack. The disadvantage of these online structural variant viewers, though, is you have to follow the kind of format that they want the data in and how they process. But it is an extra layer of step or extra step where you can visually inspect any of your structural variants uh, without having to load up massive amounts of data. Um, and it's pre-configured to be intuitive and visually strike out any patterns for you. Now, our next thing is we're actually going to get some hands-on experience in the actual IGV tutorial. Does anybody have any questions so far? We're going to practice Pardon? We're going to practice all of those. You're going to practice everything from SNVs and structural variants. Okay. Unfortunately, you're not packed bio because the data is still, um, there's not enough commonly available data to be able to practice with. But we're going to learn how to play around with IGV and actually view um, view our SNV structural variants, how to color them, how to like expand different views, how to load the tracks as well. Yes? Looks like you're using whole genome data. Yes, in this case, this is whole genome data. How about if you only have exome? So if you have all, only a whole exome, what you'll see is you'll have coverage only across the genomic regions, where the coverage then disappears in the, inter, in the intronic region or intergenic regions. Oh, well, it still works fairly well. So if you have gene fusions that happen um, between two genes, you'll see that your pair, you'll see that the reads do map across those two. Um, but you're only focusing on genomic genomic variants. Then you're not focusing on say intergenomic rearrangements where say there might be an unannotated um, 
section of the genome that's driving something. So it still works. For RNA sequencing data, you would only see it at the exon levels. So you would see your reads split across each of those exons, but they would still be connected. Yes? I may have missed it, but IGV is doing the mapping when you're loading in your reads, correct? No. no? So, so when you load up your reads, you're loading up a BAM file. A BAM file is an aligned file. Okay. Um, alignment is a much trickier process. It's a lot more computationally extensive. You use different aligners for that, and I think you cover that in module three, I believe. Um, but IGV is a way of viewing this aligned data after, or viewing your data after you've aligned it to a reference genome, which is why your reference is important. If you're studying, say, a bacterial genome or a species that isn't already available on IGV, you can actually use IGV to build these reference genomes as well, to be able to view it across any organism that you want. Yes? So IGV is strictly a visualization tool, or you can get like metrics like mutation frequency, for example? So it is a strictly visualization tool. The only mutational analytic frequency you can find is, say, up here, that little red notch over there. If you actually click on that, it tells you the breakdown of your uh, reference allele versus your alternate allele. So you get the mutational allelic frequency at that location, but it won't preemptively tell you any of that. IGV is used for visualizing data that, or is visualizing sections of the data that say a different caller has called as an SNV or as a structural variant, because you want to be able to weed out false positives before doing wet lab validations. Yes? How do you deal with the fact that the average mammalian genome is too large to be look at it in total? Mm -hmm. In other words, if I want to look at something, I have to know where to look at it. Exactly. In general, right? Exactly. So the way, you, so use IGV to try and validate different structural variants that are present. So what you would normally do is you would align your um, reads to a reference genome, and then you would run different colors on it to try and find, say, uh, structural variants that have happened, SNVs, because that's also a very tricky mathematical thing to do. And then once you get a list of specific sites where these have happened, you would then load your data in IGV and then jump to those locations to see whether those calls seem to be true or seem to be false. Before, end up, before you end up validating them. Because you might end up going, because mammalian genome is large, you might say you get 1,000 SNVs. And if from those 1,000 SNVs, you need to know which ones are true so you can validate them uh, and which ones are false. And that's where IGV comes in. So if you have very small genomes, yeah, you can just visualize your data completely. But you're not going to use it to visualize 3 billion base pairs for sure. Like that's not going to happen. Yes? Um, when you talked about genome feature particularity, uh, cosmic reported mutations. Is that something that is already uh, added to the viewer, or is something that you need to load from the So you can do one of two things. You can either download the file itself and then just drag it into IGV and it loads it on the bottom. Or if you go to the file load from server, if the file is available, it'll show it right on the annotations track. And if you just load it from that, it'll connect to the stored cosmic um, file on IGB on the Broad website and just pull that information. It's saving you the trouble of downloading it and then drag and dropping it. Oh. That's it. Um, but like I mentioned as well, because you have different versions of Cosmic and dbSNP and all of this, the version that you're using may or may not have specific annotations, so they might be missing. So you need to keep that in mind um, when you're using any of these annotation tracks. <laughs>